Okay, so good morning and welcome to this MPW A-Level Biology sample class hosted by MPW Birmingham's VP, Mr. Adam Cross. We hope you will find this session both informative and interesting. Please remember to turn your microphones off now and uh, if you have any questions we will have some time at the end um, to answer these for you. Um, but for now I'll pass over to you Adam, thank you. Adam you're on mute. <laughs> well that's a, that's a good start isn't it? <laughs> um, morning everyone, <laughs> welcome, welcome to um, our biology lesson this morning. Um, it's great for you to, to be here and thanks for taking the time out to, to join us. Um, I'd just like to briefly introduce myself first just to say hi. Um, my name is Adam Crofts, um, I teach biology, I've taught A-level biology for nearly 20 years now, which is a bit scary to say. Um, so I've had lots and lots of experience teaching A-level students, um, getting very, very high grades um, at the end of the course and getting onto very highly competitive university courses as well. Um, I also have a you know, much wider role within the college on the vice principal, um, and I work very, very closely with the university applications process. So that's a, a little bit about me. Um, Obviously, we're in a, a sort of a, a unique situation sort of globally at the moment um, where we are using these sorts of technologies um, to teach our students. And we're using Microsoft Teams you know, on a, a daily basis with our current students and teaching them. And it's been a really fantastic opportunity for us um, to explore the use of technology. And hopefully um, you'll get a feel for you know, how our online lessons um, uh, go and, and how they run at MPW. But hopefully you also get a feel of just how fantastic and how vibrant our face-to-face -face lessons are. And obviously we, we haven't got that, um, that, that ability at the moment to actually meet you in person and, and, and do this face-to-face. -face. Um, but hopefully it gives you just that little bit of a feel for what actually goes on in a real life classroom at MPW Birmingham. Um, to start with, before we actually delve into the biology, the biological theory we're going to cover today, I just want to tell you a little bit about the A-level biology specification. Um, at MPW Birmingham, we um, use the AQA exam board. So this is a picture of the front cover of the, the specification. And the specification basically lays out to us all of the things that we need to teach the students. And it tells you exactly what's in the course. If you're interested in, in the exact um, contents of the course, please, please head over to the AQA website. You can just Google AQA A-Level Biology and it'll be the first thing that comes up and you'll be able to see for yourself the structure of the course. Um, just to give you a, a couple of um, main points about this before we start. Um, the AQA specification covers a very broad range of topics. So it covers both sort of animal um, biology and plant biology. It covers sort of cellular biology and molecular biology. It covers genetics, it covers ecological sort of topics, so environmental biology. So it really provides a very, very wide range of, of topics. Um, and this is absolutely vital. Anyone that's interested in biology just as a subject on its own, or if you're interested in biology to help you with um, sort of moving on to further study of a, a biology related topic, it provides a perfect foundation for that. And actually all of those little bits, things like plant biology and environmental biology, they are really, really important, even if you don't want to study um, environmental biology in the future. Ultimately, in terms of final exams, A-level biology from AQA consists of three papers, which are all taken at the end of the course. Um, so there's paper one, two, and three, and these comprise mainly of short answer questions um, that you, you will answer. So this is where you will write you know, between sort of one and maybe six or seven lines per answer. Um, and then in the third paper, there is an extended answer, an essay question right at the very end. So A-level biology, it does need a degree of familiarity um, and, and sort of confidence with written English. Obviously, that's something that develops um, throughout the course as, as you do this anyway. And then finally, there is a practical skills assessment, and this takes place throughout the course. So there are 12 compulsory practicals that we have to complete with you. Um, and as you're doing those, we assess how you're doing them. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't make any mistakes or you can't get anything wrong, but we're looking at the development of your skills and to make sure that you have all of the key skills to be a, a capable, practical um, scientist when you go to university. So in a, a very, very small nutshell, that is 
what the, the course looks like. But please, please head over to the AQA website in your own time and have a look at the exact topics that are covered. So as the final thing, and one of the threads that I'm going to mention to you a number of times this morning is about it being a really, really vibrant specification. And we feel very, very privileged teaching A-level biology because you can look at the news on any day and you can head over to the sort of either the main headlines or to the health um, section or this environment section of any sort of news outlet. And you can find articles that are 100% relevant to a part of the specification. And it's guaranteed. I do this with my students all the time. I'll ask them to find a news article, bring along to class, and then we'll spend the first 10 minutes of the lesson looking at what they found, what's going on in the world, and how that links to the specification. And so the topic that I've chosen this morning for us to learn about is a perfect example of this. We're going to be thinking about viruses. We're going to be thinking about the structure of viruses and how they function. And obviously, you know, we, we know at the moment with COVID that this is absolutely relevant. And the, the basis of these things that you see in the biology specification helps you to be a more scientifically literate citizen, if nothing else. Even if you don't go on to study biology beyond A level, it really helps you to make sense of what's going on. And we're going to see some of those, some of those links as we go. So, like I say, sounds you know, maybe uh, a bit over the top, but it really is an exciting, vibrant specification that we teach. So our plan for today then is, like I say, to think about viruses. We're going to start with a little bit of a quiz um, just to see what you know about viruses. Um, we're going to think about generally what are the features of viruses? What do they look like? You know, what are they like in terms of their size and what they do and how they function? And then we're going to focus specifically on the HIV virus. And the reason for looking at the HIV virus, this is one that is within the AQA biology specification. So it's something that you will study um, in A-level biology. But it's a fascinating virus to look at because it typifies a lot of the features generally of how viruses work. And then to finish, we're going to think about some of these wider links to um, the sort of viruses in the media. We're going to think about you know, a number of different viruses um, that are out there that are sort of newsworthy in addition to COVID um, and, and we'll, we'll think about think about that and then to finish we will just have a final quiz um, just to see um, what you've picked up from the session. So that's our plan for this morning. Now one of the things that we like to do is um, we like to make sure that our students know what um, they're doing and how it links to the specification. So at the start of every section that we do, we provide the links to the actual AQA specification. And this provides you with a, a way of checking that what we're doing in class actually is preparing you for the exams. So what we're going to look at this morning, this is from section 3.2.4 of the AQA specification, which is about cell recognition and the immune system. And we can see here, this is telling you that for your exams, you need to know the structure of the HIV virus, and how it replicates, and then how HIV causes the symptom of AIDS, and then why antibiotics are ineffective. So we're going to focus on these things this morning, particularly about the structure of HIV, how it replicates, and how it causes symptoms. Right, so first thing I want to do then is find out what you guys know about um, viruses. So we've got a quiz, um, just some simple quiz questions, you to start with. Now, um, we use Microsoft Forms for this. And so what I will do, the link is on screen, but I will post the link in the chat box that is now appeared in your meeting chat. So if you could head, up, head on over to the meeting chat box, and if you could follow the link, that should take you through to the Microsoft Forms <laughs> quiz. And we'll just say, if you spend just a minute or two, it shouldn't take you much longer than that just to answer the three questions there, just so we can get an idea of what you know about viruses. Please, if you don't know the answer to the questions, have a go. Don't worry about it if you don't know the answers. This is giving me an opportunity just to see what you know, so I know what sort of level we can go from. So we'll say two minutes, have a go at the quiz questions, and then we'll review them together.
must admit, I enjoy watching the um, the responses roll in on Microsoft forms. It's really, really satisfying to see we've had first response, so thank you. We'll just say another minute. Right then, guys, if I can ask you to submit your answers. That'd be great. Thanks to those of you that have already responded. Right, last chance to um, submit. If you don't feel confident submitting your answers, that's absolutely fine. Please don't worry about it. But if you would like to submit your answers and if you'd like me just to, to mark them, then please um, submit um, now and then we'll have a look at what we've got. Right, OK, so um, let's start with the life processes that living organisms um, show. Um, we've got lots of, of good answers here. So we're mentioning growth, reproduction, excretion, movement. Um, they're all good. So this is looking strong. Yep, that's very good. Um, the way to re remember this, and we'll see why I'm talking about this in a second. Um, we use an acronym, Mrs. NERG. So movement, respiration, sensitivity, nutrition, excretion, reproduction, growth, Mrs. Nerg. It just gives you a, a really simple way of remembering it. Um, and so, yeah, I was asking for three of those. The second one then, um, what is the average diameter of a virus? Um, well done to those of you that said 200 to 400 nanometers. We'll talk about what a nanometer is um, in a second. So we're talking very, very small um, particles here. And then um, which of the following are um, viruses? Um, Let's have a look. So yeah, human papilloma is, is one um, and tobacco mosaic is um, one as well. Um, let me just quickly grade these. Um, they look great, fantastic. Okay, so thank you for, for doing that for me. Um, we really like Microsoft Forms as a, as a really great way of just figuring out what you know and to get, get a feel for, for where your understanding is. So thanks for that. I can see some areas where um, we need to target and some areas that we all already have pretty good knowledge of. Right, so let's start to think about what um, we're talking about this morning, the main um, theory that we're going to be looking at. The first thing we need to think about is what is a virus? Um, Viruses are microscopic, and we've seen that with the answer um, that we've just given for the size of the virus. So we know viruses are very, very small, and we know we can't see them. We've just said that they are within the nanometer range, and a nanometer is a bit one billionth of a meter. So we're talking meter go down a thousand to a millimeter, down another thousand to a micrometer, um, and then beyond that, the next jump down um, is a nanometer. So it's one billionth of a metre. Um, when we compare viruses and bacteria, um, obviously we put them into a very similar category when we think about them causing disease. But actually viruses are much, much smaller than bacteria. Um, these are another level down. So um, with bacteria, we see that they're in the sort of the micrometer range and viruses are in the nanometer range, so much smaller. Viruses are said to be acellular, and this means that they're not composed of cells. Um, so in the way we see bacteria as being single-celled organisms, and then we see more complex um, organisms being made of many cells, so multicellular organisms, viruses are not made up of cells. And that makes them quite, 
quite unique in terms of biology. Now, the big question about viruses, that is one that, you know, there are arguments on both sides. The question is, are viruses living or are they non-living? Now, in our starter quiz, we discussed the things that organisms do that make them living. So Mrs. Merg, as we said, movement, respiration, sensitivity, excretion, reproduction, and so on. The problem with viruses is that they don't really show enough of these features to be classed as living. So viruses are usually classified as actually non-living. So they're not actually organisms. They are sometimes called viral particles. Um, they certainly have some of the features of living organisms. But one of the biggest problems here is that viruses can't reproduce on their own. So a virus left on its own, let's say you've got a virus in a Petri dish on its own without contact with any other living organisms, it cannot reproduce. And so that's one of the main reasons that scientists classify them as non-living. And as we very acutely know at this point in time around the globe, viruses are disease causing. They're said to be pathogenic. Um, and so we see that the vast, vast majority of viruses are actually pathogenic in nature. And we will see why they cause disease as we move on. Now, I had to share with you, it might sound a little bit strange, but this is the sort of thing that biologists like to talk about. My favorite virus is now on screen. So out of all the viruses, um, this one is my favorite, and this is known as a T4 bacteriophage. And the T4 bacteriophage is my favorite because it has this you know, remarkably odd structure that we can see here. And on the left, we can see a micrograph um, of one. And then on the right, we can see a sort of diagrammatic representation. Now, I don't know if any of you at the weekend watched the, um, the SpaceX space launch, um, but to me, the structure of this virus makes me think of you know, some sort of spaceship or like a moon lander or, or something like that. So this is a, a really, really interesting virus. Now, we see lots of variation in viruses in terms of their structure. Um, and this is perhaps the, the oddest one that, that I know. But actually, it shares in common a lot of the features with a, sort of a general virus, if you like. And so what I'd like to think about now is just generic viral structure um, before we then apply that to the HIV virus. So the diagram we have now on screen, this is, this is actually what's known as an adenovirus. And an adenovirus is very, very common. Adenoviruses cause a lot of, you know, low level illnesses. Um, you know, they can cause things like, you know, general flu-like viral symptoms, tend not to be very, very serious um, when, when you're infected with an adenovirus. But this adenovirus structure shows us roughly what most viruses are like that they have a sort of outer coat of usually lipids and sometimes proteins. And then they've got these attachment proteins that are sticking out. So those green spikes are very, very common in viruses. And they're the mechanism by which they attach to the cell. Now, we're focusing just on, on viruses um, today. And we haven't got time to do justice all of the background information that is related to this. But if you are genuinely interested in biology and you would like to go and do some further research um, to help your understanding of viruses, I've just listed some, some sections there that you could look at. We see that proteins are a central part of um, a central part of viral structure. And so um, knowing about protein structure is really, really important. Um, RNA, we'll talk about RNA in a second. So knowing about the structure of genetic material is important enzymes and how they work again central to viruses and we'll see how that interferes with protein synthesis so the way that cells make proteins and really knowing about eukaryotic cells so more complex animal and plant type cells is central to, to this understanding like i say, I just wanted to show those to you so you could get an appreciation of, of some extra reading that you might like to do but that's what underpins our understanding of viruses so the virus that we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about today is the HIV virus. Um, HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. And this is the virus that causes the disease AIDS or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Now, this is something that really became prevalent and came to the, the knowledge of, of doctors in about the early 1980s. 
um, but was in circulation prior to that. Um, so somewhere in the 1970s, um, HIV originated. Um, it's a, a virus that it's, the treatment for this has developed very, very rapidly in the past 10 years. And actually, most people can now be very, very successfully treated for HIV. They can't be cured of it, but actually they can live a pretty normal and full life expectancy life with, with um, appropriate treatment. Doctors now tend to call AIDS advanced HIV. So AIDS is a little bit um, outdated. So it tends to be known as advanced HIV. What's special about HIV is that it targets a particular type of cell in our immune system. And um, it targets what's known as a T helper cell. Now T helper cells, these are um, produced in the thymus gland. Um, so we are um, a type of lymphocyte. Um, so just a, a white blood cell, a specific white blood cell. And what the HIV virus does is destroys the T helper cells. It infects and destroys T helper cells. Now, T helper cells, we can think of as being like, if we think about the police, um, it's a little bit like the control room of the police force, that when there is a problem initially, people call the police control centre, and then the police control centre makes calls to the different policemen and the different police units, and then they respond to whatever the problem is. The T helper cell does exactly the same thing. It's the cell that's central to our immune response. So it will play a role in detecting the fact that there's some sort of infection in the body, and then it will coordinate a number of different responses to get them into play to get rid of the threat. And those responses are, are numerous, and they involve you know, other T cells, they involve what we know as B cells, so another type of lymphocyte, and they involve other immune cells as well. Now, we're just going to take a minute to think about um, the, the central role of the T helper cell, because actually this is central to what scientists are find out, finding out about COVID-19 as well, that T, T cells and T helper cells have a really central role. What we can see um, on, on the screen, just for this little diagram, is that we have got an antigen, and this is a marker that is found on things like viruses. So imagine that the viral particle or part of the viral particle, actually this is a, a foreign marker that is being detected by the immune system. This foreign marker is then presented by immune cells known as antigen presenting cells. And this is detected by our wonderful T helper cells. And we can see the T helper cells there detecting the antigen. And then we can see the knock on effect that they ultimately will then stimulate other immune cells. B cells produce antibodies. Um, Macrophages are, they engulf pathogens, so they're what are known as phagocytic cells. And then T killer cells, they're my favorite immune cells, they actually punch holes in the surface of infected cells to destroy them. So it's part of sort of like a, a seek and destroy sort of cell. What we see then is that if HIV causes these T helper cells to be destroyed, it has a major and detrimental impact on the ability of someone's immune system to respond. And it doesn't just cut off one of these pathways, it potentially cuts off all of these pathways. So this is why it's an immunodeficiency virus, because it causes deficiencies in your immune system, causes problems with your immunity, it stops these cells being activated. So it's a, a, quite an elegant mechanism, quite an elegant virus for actually killing um, a host. Now, in terms of the specific structure of HIV, which we can see on screen now, we don't need to worry about all of the, the words here. So we've got lots of um, sort of complex sort of terminology here. Um, we need to firstly spot this protein complex. This is known as a glycoprotein complex. So it's a protein that has got carbohydrate chains attached to it. This is central to the HIV infecting the cell, which we'll see in a second. We've then got a lipid membrane. And the lipid membrane of um, the HIV virus has the same structure as the cell membrane of a, an animal cell. What we see then is an internal capsid. And what's most important is that this contains the RNA, the genetic material of the virus. Now, the HIV virus is known as a retrovirus. And the retrovirus refers to the fact that its RNA that is the genetic material 
um, within the capsid. So it's not DNA. We probably know, you know, about DNA. RNA is just a slightly different version of genetic material. And then some other important things that we need to note. We've got three enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that speed up specific reactions. So we've got three enzymes here, integrase enzymes, reverse transcriptase, and proteases. And we'll see their role in a second. So that is the general HIV structure. But we can see, if we were thinking back a few slides to the generic structure of a virus. This ticks all of those boxes. It's got that outer covering and it's got those little attachment proteins and then inside it's got its genetic material. So very, very simple. Here we've got a micrograph of um, HIV particles. I, I always like to show micrographs because obviously we see lovely textbook examples, really nice, neat pictures. In reality, you know, it's not quite as, as sort of neat as that. We can see HIV particles. The poor quality of the image here is because viruses are so, so small. So if we were looking at a bacterium, we'd be able to see loads and loads more detail. Actually, it's really difficult to see viral particles clearly because of their small size. So what makes viruses so harmful? We're going to think now about the mechanism that HIV uses to infect cells. And we're going to think about why this is problematic um, for cells and why it causes harm. So we're going to use an animation here um, just so you can see how this works in reality, how this, um, you know, actually all the movement that goes with it. So we start off here with the HIV um, virus, as we've talked about. And we can see all of those key features. We've got those glycoproteins on the outside. We've got the lipid envelope known as a phospholipid bilayer. We've got the capsid in the middle. So we name in the proteins there. GP120 is the key one as the, the surface, um, surface protein. We've got the capsid proteins inside, other proteins involved, various other things which we don't need to worry about here. And then right in the middle um, of that capsid, we've got the RNA. And then we've got those three enzymes that we talked about, the reverse transcriptase, the protease, and the integrase. So the HIV particle then comes into contact with um, the cell. And what we have here is the binding of that GP120 protein, that glycoprotein that's on the, the surface, to a complementary receptor. So the shape of this receptor fits perfectly um, with, with that. And this is something that the HIV virus has evolved. Um, that shouldn't be the way. A normal cell, it doesn't want to have a viral attachment protein that's complementary to this receptor. So the virus has evolved this mechanism so it can infect this particular type of cell. This is a specific interaction. So the receptor is known as a CD4 receptor, and this is a receptor that's only present on T helper cells, only present on that specific type of white blood cell. So here it's bound, made a nice firm connection. Not all viral particles do bind, so some will have to just bounce off, some will roll along and not be able to find a particle, um, but here we've got one that has. What happens then is that the HIV particle fuses with the membrane and the membranes become one. So that what was that outer lipid coat now actually becomes part of the cell membrane. And what this allows to happen is that genetic material and those enzymes to enter the cell. And that's where we pick it up here. So within the cytoplasm of the cell, we've now got the viral RNA that's floating around. The first enzyme that works is reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase basically produces a DNA copy of the viral RNA. So it's like making a, a, a photocopy, but in a slightly different form. So you may be photocopying from one type of paper to another type of paper. Very, very similar, but, but just slightly different. And that's, that's what's going on with the RNA and the DNA. We're making a DNA copy of the RNA. And that viral RNA is now done. Its genetic code has been copied onto the DNA. We then can get a second strand of DNA being made. And these will then form a double helix, a DNA double helix. And in this case, it's a, a loop. It's a circular loop of DNA. So the viral DNA, all of that viral code is now encoded on that piece of DNA. This now passes inside the nucleus of the cell. And we can see here just the little pores, the nuclear pores, and that's how 
it gains access. The viral DNA then is integrated into the host cell genome, the host cell DNA, using the enzyme integrase. So integrase basically integrates that DNA now to become part of the host cell genome. Now let's just stop there for a minute and think about that. This is where it gets a little bit scary because you've got a pathogenic um, particle, the viral particle, that has been able through these mechanisms to get its genetic material, not just floating around in the cell, but actually incorporated into your nuclear, nuclear DNA. Pretty scary stuff. So it's actually changed your DNA. It's actually effectively produced you know, a massive change, a massive mutation in your DNA. Now, one of the things that we said that is central to this is the mechanism of protein synthesis. And what we see is two things then happening. We get RNA polymerase, another enzyme, and this is just naturally in the cell, producing um, from that viral DNA, messenger RNA and viral genome RNA. Now, these will do two things. The copy of the viral genome RNA, this is that RNA that was found in the um, HIV particle. So it's actually telling the cell to make more copies of the virus's RNA, the virus's genetic material. And then the messenger RNA, this is going to go and be decoded to make proteins. And the proteins that it's telling the cell to make are the proteins needed for the viral particles. So let's see how this pans out. The viral, DNA, the viral um, RNA and the messenger RNA then pass out of the nucleus. And we then get the messenger RNA being decoded to make proteins. And this is where our final enzyme, the protease enzyme, comes and breaks up those proteins. And this basically then forms the proteins that are needed to make another virus. So the cell has basically just been tricked into making more of these attachment proteins and making the proteins that um, make up the rest of the virus. And it's also been tricked into making more of the enzymes that the virus needs. And it's been tricked into making more copies of the genetic material of the virus. So what we've got here is a hijack. The virus has hijacked the cell. It's got its own genetic material into the nuclear DNA of the cell. And then it's tricked the cell to actually replicate the genome, the viral genetic material, and all of the proteins needed. And then what happens is that these proteins, some of them embed in the membrane, and the membrane then pinches off to form a new viral particle. Viruses can't do this on their own, and this is why they're non-living, because they need cells, they need living cells to do this. But like I say, we've just basically seen a hijack. The virus has hijacked the cell's own um, sort of mechanism of working to make more copies of itself. It's pretty, it's elegant stuff, maybe a little bit scary as well. Now, in terms of how other viruses work, there's lots and lots of differences, slight differences in how they work. So not all viruses are retroviruses. So there are plenty of viruses that have DNA as the genetic material, not RNA. Um, but all in all, the actual mechanism of viral infection is very, very similar. But the question we've got to ask ourselves is, OK, this is fine. The virus is making copies of itself. Surely that's not a problem. What we see then is that viral particle can go and infect other cells. But what also happens is that when this happens in enough numbers, the bursting out, the release of these new viral particles can actually burst the cell membrane of the cell. And in HIV and, in, and a lot of other viruses as well, it's the bursting of the cell membrane when the viruses move out like that, that actually causes the damage. That cell is now dead. The other thing that can cause problems and how HIV can, can destroy healthy T cells and T hoc cells, sorry, is to deplete their resources. It's using the resources of the cell to make its own proteins. And so those resources aren't available to be used by the, the cell itself. So they get deprived of the things that they need. And then sometimes, um, and this is, you know, been found sort of more recently by scientists, is that because of the integration of um, DNA, of sort of the viral genetic code into the host cell genome, actually it can induce the cell to destroy itself. 
So the cell knows that something isn't quite right. It knows it's been hijacked sometimes. And it can basically flip the self-destruct switch. It's known as apoptosis, basically a self-destruct mechanism. And that means that it's another way that the cell can be destroyed. Now, we can tolerate a certain amount of cell destruction in our bodies, but once we get past a certain point, we start to have detrimental effects. So with T helper cells, once we get to a certain number of T helper cells being destroyed and the number of T helper cells in your body dipping below a certain level, that's when you start to get the sort of the immunodeficiency that we've talked about. So what we've got there is specifically how um, HIV works, but most of those features are in common with most of the viruses and, and, and especially COVID-19. So just to, to finish off then, I just want us to think about viruses in the news and in the media. And we will mention COVID-19 very briefly at the end, but it's got enough, uh, you know, it's in the media enough at the moment. There are vast, vast numbers of viruses um, out there that cause diseases that you will know about. Um, measles I've mentioned here. Uh, measles is something that is routinely vaccinated against. But in the Western world, we've seen um, uptake of measles vaccines decreasing over the past sort of, 10 to 20 years. And what this means is that um, there's the potential around the world for some resurgence of these diseases um, where vaccine rates have maybe fallen. Measles is one of those. And this is a recent article just from April um, about potential measles resurgence because of COVID-19 indirectly. Um, and the link here is that, well, actually, if fewer people are going to see their doctors because they're in isolation and they're not getting vaccinated, then we've got the potential that measles might, might show resurgence. So measles um, caused by a virus is a viral disease. Um, one which is a particular interest to me, um, my, my area of speciality um, is cancer biology. Um, and there's a virus known as the HPV virus, the human papilloma virus, that is known to cause cancer. So we know that most cancers are caused by other things. But actually, HPV is one virus that causes cancer, and it causes cervical cancer. And this is something that we've had a vaccine rolled out in this country in the past, um, I think it's four or five years old now, but it's routinely given to school-aged children to try and reduce the incidence. So human papilloma virus, another really, really interesting and very, very relevant um, virus. One that we know, all know, and maybe love um, is the common cold. Common colds are caused by, you know, quite a range of different viruses. Um, but it's the classic virus to think about because what we know about the cold virus is that it um, mutates very, very frequently. And so it's one of these things that scientists haven't developed effective sort of vaccinations for, partly because it's not very serious in terms of its effects and partly because it's you know, very, very frequently um, mutating. So yeah, we can't forget about the common cold and influenza as well as being caused by viruses. And then obviously I can't mention viruses without talking about COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 we know is a, a part of a group of viruses known as coronaviruses. And we know coronaviruses as being very, very widespread. There are lots and lots of different types of coronavirus. Um, in recent years, the most serious being SARS and MERS, so severe acute respiratory syndrome, the virus that causes that, and MERS, Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, the virus that causes that, they're both coronaviruses. Obviously, with this particular strain of, of um, cor the coronavirus, COVID-19, scientists are, are working and still finding out what's going on in terms of its structure. And they've worked fast, they've got a pretty good knowledge, and most of those background principles about how viruses work will relate to COVID. It's just about finding those little differences that make it unique, that is what scientists are working you know, tirelessly on at the moment. Right, okay, so I am pretty much out of time there with you guys, but I would just like us to do a very, very quick final quiz, just to get you thinking about some of the terms that we've been um, talking about um, in this session. So once again, I will. Um, so in your chat box, you've got the link to the, just a quick quiz for us to finish. Um, again, we'll just say two minutes now, just multiple choice. So you should be able to whiz through them quite quickly. 
submit your answers if you would like me to look at them and then we'll have time for some questions. So we'll just say two minutes. Just while you're doing that, I've just posted your scores back to you from our starter quiz. So you can have a look at those and see which ones you've got right and which ones you didn't. And we'll just say one more minute on this um, closing quiz. Um, so if you can submit your answers as soon as possible, that will be great. Thank you. Right then, so last um, last responses, please. If you would like me to have a look at these, if you'd like them graded, then please um, submit now. If not, please, please don't worry. Um, not compulsory, um, but if you would like me to look at them, then, then please submit. Right, thanks to those of you that have submitted. That's fantastic. Let's have a quick look at these answers then. Um, question one, what does the term acellular mean? Well done to those of you that got this right. It means not made from, from living cells. So we said viruses are acellular, not made from living cells. Good. Second question, what is a retrovirus? Well done, everyone got this right. So it's a virus that contains RNA as its genetic material. Very well done. Question three, what does reverse transcriptase do? This uses the RNA as a template to create a DNA copy of the genetic material. So lots of correct answers there. Well done. And then finally, what is the role of the integrase enzyme? This catalyzes the integration of the DNA into the host cell genome. Um, remember, it doesn't catalyze the integration of the RNA because that RNA is first used as a template to make a DNA copy, and then it's the DNA that is integrated. So well done on that. Um, again, I'll post your scores back to you so you can see how you've done and give you a chance just to reflect on what we've, we've talked about today. Right, so that brings us to the end of our very, very quick whistle-stop tour of some key information about viruses. I hope you found it um, interesting. And please, please, one of the key things about science at A-level is that if you find something interesting, go away and do some more research and reading on it. If you found viruses interesting, if you're interested in worth finding out more, go away and, and, and do some reading. Find out some more. Loads of information out there that can help you to understand, um, you know, the fascinating things that the viruses are. Right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, happy to take any questions now. Thank you so much. That was really, really good, uh, really interesting. Um, yeah, so anybody, if you do have some questions, can you please type them now into the meeting chat? Um, we'll give you just a couple of uh, a couple of minutes just to ask those questions, then Adam can answer them for you. Um, but yeah, really informative session. Thank you so much, Adam. Okay, so we have the first question from Mia. Um, if we will be doing online classes, how will we be doing the experiments? Um, obviously, we 
are we're confident that next year um, we'll be able to teach face to face um, in, in college. Um, if there are any further periods of disruption, um, then what we'll we'll do is we will um, prioritise getting the practicals done during the times we're in college. So we'll look at probably you know when we are able to meet um, sort of face to face and teach face to face, we'll get them done as quickly as possible. In a worst case scenario situation, which I don't think we'll we'll face, um, what we would do is we would um, we would use demonstrations, we would use videos. Um, we would use sort of exercises, sort of classroom-based exercises to, to work on the same skills. So we'd be hoping to get as close as possible to the experience and developing exactly the same skills um, if, you know, we can't carry out a practical at that particular point. But, but we're, we're hopeful that, you know, we'll be, we'll be able to, um, we'll have plenty of time, even if it is disrupted and throughout the year to do the practicals. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So just give you another couple of seconds for anyone else to ask any questions for Adam. Um, if any of you do have any further questions um, that you, you maybe don't want to ask in an online forum, then please, um, if you email the international team and they will, um, they'll be able to, to, to send them through to me. Just a quick question here from Cheng. Um, please share with us how to engage students during online teaching. <laughs> I'm assuming this is how do you interact with your students by online and, and as opposed to being in person, I assume that's the question. Um, one of the things, obviously, we don't quite get the feel for it in a sort of a, a taster session like this, um, because obviously, you know, I, I don't yet know. I don't know all of you. Um, and so it can be difficult um, with this. In a, a main teaching session, um, we have lots and lots of two-way interaction. So because of our very, very small group sizes at MPW, we've got an absolute guaranteed maximum of nine in a group at MPW, and the average is about six. So it means we get lots and lots of individual interaction. I know my students very well, as do all of our teachers. And so it means that you will get questions coming at you very, very frequently um, that you will need to respond. Um, we also use things like um, quizzes on Microsoft Forms, which give me a really good idea about where students are at and what they know and what they don't know. And it gives me that sort of understanding of their progress. Um, but something that we've we've really taken the opportunity to develop since we've, we've been doing online lessons is using the technology to our benefit. So in biology, we've had some fantastic um, projects going on that have involved um, sort of group work. Um, in sort of smaller teams on um, smaller groups on teams. Um, we've had student presentations where so they've done been doing research and they've done a research led presentation. Um, we've had um, some problem based learning exercises going on recently as well, which have given students the chance to do um, some self directed learning. So we, we're using lots and lots of different mechanisms um, to really get the students engaged and it's, it's been working fantastically well. But as the sort of the foundation principle of how we engage our students, it really is that, you know, very, very frequent questioning of our students, just little questions here and there, getting students to explain things to us, um, getting them to put it into their own words and share it with classmates. Um, so it's a surprisingly um, sort of engaged environment. And, and certainly we, we don't feel um, sort of, you know, uh, we don't feel that it's a, a poor quality experience. Um, in, compared to the classroom. Great, thank you so much um, for clarifying that. Um, so Adam, I think that draws us to a close for this session. Thank you very, very much. Um, and to all those that joined, thank you too. Um, if you have any questions moving forward, please do not hesitate in emailing us to international at mpw.ac.uk. Um, but for now, thank you very much. And we hope to see you in person very soon. Take care. Thanks everyone. <laughs>